Wow, wow, we have started. Where is my other phone? Welcome, 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 welcome to the service. Today, I'm doing it from my office. Been working, thank you. Been working here. Most of the day, we have construction going on. We've started phase two of our construction. And uh, we are spending most of our days here. Right. Welcome, welcome. I see uh, uh, Ambassador Kathy. You there? Uh, um, Ambassador Kathy, you there? Um, come out, Evangeline. You are there. I see John. John, today we missed you on site. I'm sure tomorrow you're going to be with us. Gregory, uh, Deaconess Helen, Susan. Oh, Susan, we talked a bit today, and I'm happy with what God is doing in your life. Naomi Fever, Pauline Treasure, how have you been? Uh, all right, Pauline. Margaret testimony. See you there. Ruth Oboz uh, in the UK. You are there. I know we've started early today, but better. Better because uh, we want to, we want to, just try to get a nice pose here so that I can talk to us. Okay, okay, this is lovely. Lovely. Welcome, welcome. Please love, share wherever you are. And uh, let me know you're there. Don't just silently creep into the service. No, it's good for me to know that you, you are there. And uh, your expectations also, you know. We've had a lovely, lovely, uh, what do you call it? The one we had at lunchtime. The love and relationship thing. And I got a lot of texts, by the way, and a lot of SMSs after that. Some of the questions, I'll be answering them on Tuesday because tomorrow, tomorrow I'm dealing with, um, what do you call it? How to design your mate. Tomorrow basically I'm dealing with the singles. The singles tomorrow is your finding your miracle mate is tomorrow so yeah so please don't forget at 1 at 1 p.m up to 2 30 the program will be on now we've been looking at the the subject of uh, the subject of uh, uh, dominion of a sickness i'm just trying to bring my mind back i'm from meditation and study you know, and sometimes when, when you're under deep anointing, it becomes a bit challenging to, to communicate truth. That's why sometimes we, we like having a time between your prayer time and your study time on the altar. Just helps you to get back to yourself. But anyway, I think I'm getting, I'm, uh, I'm getting settled. Now, I've been trying to help you understand that sickness is not your portion. No matter 
how the religious mind will try to <laughs> justify sickness and sometimes even make it look like an act of God or the will of God. The truth is sickness is not God's will for your life or for my life. It's, it has never been. In fact, one of the things that Jesus came to deal with is, uh, uh, what do you call it, is sickness. One of the things he dealt with on the cross is sickness. Once you begin to understand that, then you will stop justifying sickness in your mind and uh, uh, in your uh, okay, all right, so please, guys, let's concentrate. Questions will come later. Some of you are sending me some questions about some things I handled in the afternoon service. This is no relationship now. We, we, are, we are handling the topic of dominion over sickness, but I'll answer your text later. Now, uh, once you stop justifying, sickness in your mind, then your will is positioned against it. You know, you must understand, child of God, you must understand that your will is so important in any spiritual transaction. Your will, your will is key when you're dealing with spiritual things. That's why most of the time, Jesus will ask the people, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? God's power can be available, but your will determines how much your faith will collect. You see, there can be no faith without human will. And that's why I insist, in fact, there's a clip that is playing on our page. And I, 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 and I told us on Sunday first service, you must set your mind, your will, and your emotions against a sickness. You, you must set it. You must... You must set your mind, your will, and your emotions against sicknesses and diseases. It's, it's very important in your battle against this demonic attack on human bodies. You must not justify it in your mind, okay? You must refuse it with everything. Look at the verse we read uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. I'm just in my office. There are many papers here. Just understand me. I'm just from study. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, verse number, verse number 20. It says, it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. It says, in what? In your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in your body. Now, you cannot glorify God in your body when your body is sick. It's not possible. It says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I insist you really have to set your mind and your will 
against sickness, against diseases, and refuse the testimony of your senses and accept the testimony of the word. Symptoms, pain, and discomfort of the body, these are what we call the testimony of your senses. Refuse to accept it and accept the testimony of Christ, which is the word. That's why in Isaiah 53, when he's talking about sickness, verse 1, he says, whose report are you going to believe? In other words, whose testimony are you going to accept as fact and as reality? So once you allow your senses, that is the testimony of your body, to govern your mind, to govern your will, you lose the battle of your health. No matter the symptoms in your body, no matter the, the, the inconveniences of your flesh, do not accept them as reality in your mind or in your emotions. Isaiah 53 verse 1, he begins by saying, whose report will you believe? Look at it. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 53 verse number 1. Are we getting blessed? Isaiah 53 verse number 1. I'm just trying to get there. It says, who, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In other words, he is saying there are two contradictory reports here. Your body has a report and your body gives its report through your feelings, through your senses. Jesus also has a report. This report is what I'm calling the testimony. The testimony of the body is your senses. The testimony of Jesus is his word. Now, when you lean on the testimony of your body, that is the symptoms of sickness in your body, the uncomfortability, the pain, the discomfort, and then accept it in your mind as reality, you have lost the battle for your health. Because you must understand that your mind is a conversion place, the conversion room of spiritual things to become physical or physical things to become spiritual. Everything taking place in your life has to go through the place of the mind. Once you take the word of God as reality and then accept it in your mind, then the reality comes to your body. Once you accept the testimony of the senses, how you're feeling, the pain and the discomfort, and then accept it in your mind, as reality, then your spirit is registered as sickness. That's why you really have to guard your mind because your mind is your battlefield. That is where you lose or you win. Your mind is the arena of faith. That is what will determine whether your faith will deliver your inheritance in Christ, or your body will take the preeminence in your life, your mind, your mind. I believe this is why it says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he, as he thinketh, as he thinketh, as he thinketh. So, when you allow the testimony of the body to govern your mind, then your will becomes weak and you lose the battle for your health. But when you allow the word of God to become the only true and living testimony, then your mind is 
is, is, is agrees with the word and your will is energized and all of a sudden you realize that the symptoms are not there. The pain has disappeared. You are no longer the sick person that your body was telling you. You know, child of God, understand something here. You are not your body. Your body is where you live. So don't let your body tell you who you are. Tell your body who you are. Let me repeat myself. You are not your body. You live inside your body. So don't let the symptoms in your body tell you who you are. No, tell your body who you are. You are the healed of the Lord. You are the blessed of the Lord. You are seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. You are all those things. So don't let your body preach to you. No, preach to your body. It's the problem of most of us is that we have allowed our bodies to tell us who we are. And we have allowed the situation of our body to become our mentality and our reality. That is where most of us have lost the battle for our health. Okay. But the moment you know the difference between you and your body. For instance, if a believer gets sick and then the believer dies when he is sick or the sickness actually sends the believer home. Please note the word sends the believer home. Would the believer go to heaven? Of course, yes, because he is not sick. It is his body that is sick. As long as you're born again, your ticket to heaven is settled. So will the believer get to heaven if he dies of sickness? Emphatically, yes, because he is not the body. The body will be left here, buried, turned to dust, and life will continue. In fact, the moment you step out of your body, that is the time you are in eternity. There is no between body and spirit experience. No, to be absent from the body is what? Is to be present with the Lord. It's an immediate thing. In fact, most people die before they are pronounced dead. In fact, most people live before they are pronounced dead because sometimes the heart is beating. The body is still warm. But you left. The miracle of resurrection is calling a spirit back to the body. That's the miracle of resurrection. Now, when your body is sick, you must understand that is not you. That is your body. Just like when you get to your house and your house is dirty, does it mean you're dirty? No, it is your house that is dirty, not you. So you can tell people to clean it or you can clean it yourself. So if your house is dirty, does it mean you're dirty? No. You see, differentiate between who you are and where you live. You are a spirit, but you live inside your body. And that's why even a believer can get sick because although we are born again, our bodies are not born again. Our bodies are made of dust. Our bodies are not born again. Whatever is not redeemed must be delivered, must be controlled, must be taken care of. When you got born again, it is your spirit that was recreated into the image and the likeness of God, not your body. And that's why if you're born again and you're dark, you're still dark. If you're born again and you're light, you're still light. Because it's not your body that got born again. Your body did not get born again. 
neither did your mind get born again. And that's why he says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Because your mind was not born again. The part of it that was born again is your spirit, the inner you. That's so why you're born again, but you still think the same way you used to think before you got born again. Now, there are three kinds of salvations. I think I told us this sometimes back. You were saved. Who was saved? Your spirit. When you received Christ. You are being saved. Who is being saved? Your mind. As you renew it, it begins to think the way your spirit man is. Then the third salvation is of your body. You shall be saved when Christ comes and then immortality will swallow mortality. And the Bible says, we shall be like him and so shall we be with him. All right. So salvation is instant. But deliverance is a process. Deliverance of the body from sickness, deliverance of your mind from wrong thoughts and wrong patterns, that is a process. And that's why the more you hear the word of God, the more your mind thinks like your recreated perfect spirit. And then your mind and your spirit now begins to draw your body to look like Christ. And that is how now you are able to fight sickness and disease as a believer. You know, for example, pain comes to your body. Symptoms of all kinds of sickness comes to your body. And I tell you the truth. No believer is above reproach. You can be attacked. But of course, there is how to build spiritual immunity so that the attack does not even come close to you. But what if it comes? Good enough. You can be attacked. But when you are attacked, don't accept the testimony of your body as a reality in your mind. Because you're not your body. It is an attack that has come to your body. That sickness. Begin to think that way. Don't accept sickness as part of life. No. Treat sickness as a foreigner to your body. Because your body no longer belongs to you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, for your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. This is so powerful and I love this portion of God's word. Chapter 6, it says, verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 19. It says, it says, what? No, you know that your body... Uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You see, when you get born again, your body is no longer yours. That's why as a believer, you should dress decently. You should work out so that you don't mess with your body. You should Keep your body clean, I mean, by showering and well personal grooming and all these things. And that's what the Bible says, godliness, bodily exercise, profited a little. I mean, you cannot be a believer and you just eat any junk and you just, you know, you don't exercise, you don't watch your diet, you don't, you don't clean your body. That is anti-scriptures because the Bible tells us that the body is no longer ours. And that's why a believer should be dressed well. You can't just dress all your body parts are out as a woman. And you're coming to church and you're telling us your fashion, your choice. That is the world. That is not the kingdom. The kingdom says glorify God in your body and in your spirit. You can't dress anyhow and then you say you're glorifying God because you're causing a brother to stumble. Imagine a sister comes to church and part of her breasts are out. Her thighs are out. Are you telling us you're glorifying God in your body and in your spirit? No. You can't say you dress your choice. You're no longer your own. Your body belongs to Jesus. Dress decently. Watch out your health. Don't eat anything saying that 
am the heel of the Lord. No, it should, it should watch what you eat. It should exercise. The, the Bible says bodily exercise, profiteth a little. So there is, there is how you handle your body as a believer. Because please don't forget, your body is not born again. Salvation is instant, but deliverance is not just a process, it's a lifetime process. You can't, see you, you can't say that you've eaten for the last 45 years, so you'll not eat again. It's a daily thing. So it's a lifetime process. Okay, so I think, I think this is very, very important. I needed you to have that understanding. How much time do I have left? All right, still have some time. Now, we, 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 we looked at number one, seven steps to divine health. Uh, number one was what? Know your rights, your rights of healing. Understand that healing belongs to you in Christ. Then number two, this was on Sunday, I said, expose yourself to the reading, the hearing, and the practice of the word. The word is a healer today. Remember that? Expose yourself. And I think that was a very, very important point. In, 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 in uh, just remind us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, says, My son, uh, attend to my words, give ear to my sayings, let them not depart from thine heart. Let them not depart from thine heart. It says, keep them in the midst of thine heart. It says, verse 22, for their healing, for their life to those who find them. That is a word. And healing to your flesh. So I said, expose yourself to the reading and the hearing of God's word. Remember we said that part of preaching is healing. Part of preaching is healing. Now forget that. That if you expose yourself well to the word of God, the word will heal you even without prayer. And I am really trying to emphasize on that because religion has taught us that there is some space between, uh, you know, hearing the word, then you're prayed for, then you're healed. I don't see that formula in the Bible. The Bible says he sent his word, Psalm 107 verse 20, and healed them. In fact, on Sunday, in our third service, manifesting the spiritual program, and I thank God for your feedback. Uh, I'm really getting a lot of positive feedback for that program. You'll see a testimony of one of my daughters who just got healed by hearing. I never laid hands on her. Sickness of over 18 years. Is it? Is it 18 years? 18 years, used very thick glasses, and she is a dentist. I don't know, you, you can't fake that one because she removes teeth every day, deals with dental issues and all that. So she got healed. She no longer uses that. Now she has two clinics, divinely healed by God. You, 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 that testimony is all that will feature on Sunday. And she will be there herself and tell us her experience. But she got healed by just hearing and hearing. That's why he said in, in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 15, he said, the multitudes came to hear and to be healed. And then verse 17, as he was teaching, the power of God was present to heal. Luke chapter 5 verse 15, and then verse 17. And then Luke chapter 6, verse 17, it says, people came from Tyre and Sidon to hear and to be healed of their diseases. In Jeremiah, I wish I can get that verse, Jeremiah says, the word of God is like a hammer. So anytime you hear the word of God, it breaks into pieces anything in your body and in your life that is not of God. So that was number two, expose yourself to the hearing and to the reading of God's word and to the acting of the word. The word becomes flesh as you act it out. The word becomes flesh. The word becomes reality as you act it out. Now forget that. The word of God becomes a part of you as you act it out. The word you've not acted out will not really help you because 
it becomes flesh, it becomes reality to us as we act it out. So knowing the word is not enough. You must act it out. You must practicalize it. The Bible says those who hear the word of God and they don't do it, you see, they deceive themselves. So we looked at that uh, last Sunday. Number three, we looked at the power of understanding. The power of understanding. Psalm 119, verse 144, it says, the, the testimonies something are everlasting. The righteousness of thy testimonies are everlasting. And then he says, give me understanding and I shall live. Give me understanding. There is life in spiritual understanding. There is healing in spiritual understanding. Any time you spiritually understand the word of God by the help of the Holy Spirit, it adds to your health. It adds to your health. Your body naturally gets well by the understanding of scripture. And you know, we, we read something yesterday in Ephesians 4 verse 18. It says anytime you're ignorant of the word, you're ignorant of spiritual things, it says you are alienated from the life of God. You're not able to walk in the reality of the life of God, which is called Zoe. So yesterday we looked at the importance of spiritual understanding. And I think that is very, very important. I think that is very, very important. Don't just seek to have knowledge of the word. Seek to understand the word. Seek to understand. And you can only understand the word by the help of the Holy Spirit as you meditate on it, and as you repeatedly hear it, and you repeatedly read it. Repetition brings revelation by the help of the Holy Spirit. Repetition brings revelation by the help of the Holy Ghost. Am I communicating? Are you guys getting blessed? Ambassador, there is life and healing in spiritual understanding. Joy and the word of God becomes a reality in our lives when we act it. Yes, yes, yes. Are you guys there? Are you, are you, are you understanding me? Are you getting blessed? You know, talk to me. Are you getting blessed today? I need some feedback here. Number four, as you're giving me feedback, is accept the finished works of Christ on the cross as a present reality. Number four is accept the finished works of Christ on the cross as a present reality. Accept, please catch number four. We are on the seven steps to securing your divine healing and working divine health. Number four, accept. Accept the finished works of Christ on the cross as a present reality. Ambassador, I'm very blessed. Susan, very blessed. Pauline, getting blessed. Papa, thank you. Thank you for this feedback. I need, I need to get feedback. Uh, I, need, I need feedback. I need to know whether you, we are together. Accept, accept the finished works of Christ on the cross as present reality. The story of Jesus dying on the cross is not a story, it's reality. It is not a story, it is reality. Now, you know, we take it very simple. Jesus came, he suffered, he was crowned with thorns, he was lashed 39, that is a 40 minus one, lashes on his back, then he died. On the third day he resurrected, and now he sat at the right of the Father. 
we, 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 we are so casual in it or with it until we have lost the very essence of God in what happened at Golgotha. I'd like you to accept it that what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 plus years ago is still affecting humanity today. It is actually the power of a believer. Now, what did he do on the cross? What happened? When we talk about the finished works of Christ on the cross, what exactly are we talking about? Because I realize many people don't understand it. They think it's about he died. Uh, Jesus died. Okay, yes. Has he suffered? Yes. Okay. Even a Muslim knows that. Even the self-proclaimed atheists, they know. That's why they want to deny that it's God because they have that knowledge. So what happened on the cross? There are three things. Mainly three things. There are other things, but mainly three things did Jesus come to take away from man on the cross. On the cross, he dealt with your sin. On the, cross, on the cross, he dealt with your sickness. And on the cross, he dealt with your poverty. Once you accept this as a present reality, the power that raised Jesus from the dead starts surging through your body instantly. The cross, the cross. Now, let's go one by one. Sin, he dealt with sin. Let's look at it. First, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Three things he dealt with. On the cross. One, sin. Two, sickness. Three, poverty. The same power that saved you from sin is the same power that will save you from sickness. And it's the same power that will save you from poverty. Oh, how come? I know I'm born again. One of God, I know I'm born again. I know I'm going to heaven. If I ask how many are going to heaven, everyone watching here who is born again, you have an assurance. They're going to heaven. You don't need any prophecy. You're going to heaven. Can I su su submit this to you this evening? The same power that delivered you from sin is the same power that delivered you. Not who delivered. Delivered you from sickness. And is the same power that delivered you from poverty. So a believer should not accept sin or sickness or poverty as part of life. That's why I told us during the lunchtime program that no one will go to hell because of sin. The sin question was dealt with on the cross. People will go to hell because they rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not because of sin. Yes, before Christ died, sin made man an enemy of God. After Christ died, sin no longer makes man an enemy of God. Because God no longer deals with man direct. God deals with us in Christ Jesus. God deals with us through Christ, in Christ, by Christ, with Christ. As a matter of fact, this will bless you. I don't know if you're ready for this. Anyone who is born again looks exactly like Jesus. God cannot differentiate between you and Christ if you're born again. Because if you're born again, you have put on Christ. Hey. You have put on Christ. It's no longer you. It is Christ that lives in you. He no longer deals with you. That's why sin cannot separate you from God. Why? Because Christ 
has become our righteousness. Galatians, Galatians, this is before we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Galatians puts this fact out there. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and chapter 3, verse 27. Look at it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Look at this. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. It says, and the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then chapter 3, verse 27, Galatians 3, 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So God does not see Matko. God does not see John. God does not see Judah. God does not see Sylvia. God sees Christ in every one of us because since you have been baptized into Christ, it says we have put on Christ. Again, that confirms to me and to you that sin then cannot be the separation between man and God. If you have received Christ, you are no longer, you're no longer there. You died with him. You have resurrected with him. He no longer sees you. He sees Christ in you. You have put on Christ. And this is one of the realities of the finished works on the cross. In our 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at it. This is very powerful. Verse, verse 17. Oh, sorry. Verse 17, just a page behind. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, it says, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, okay, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 21, let's jump to verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be seen for us. Powerful, powerful. Who knew no sin? that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we're in point number four, accepting as a reality the finished works of Christ on the cross. That is the fourth point to securing your healing. And I'm trying to tell you what happened. What are these finished works? There are mainly three. He dealt with our sin. He dealt with our sickness. And he dealt with our poverty. As a believer, sickness is not your portion. Poverty is not your portion. And also sin or the guilt of sin is not your portion. No matter what you do, if you're born again, you cannot be separated from God. This is very powerful. I know it is, it is, it is a, it is against religious thinking. But that is the scriptures. Now, let, let's look at it. So one, we've seen that he dealt with our sin on the cross. He was made sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Then number two, he dealt, he took away our sicknesses. Isaiah 53, let's get there. Isaiah chapter 53. Still on the cross. These are the finished works of Christ on the cross. So when you talk about accept as a reality, as a present day reality, the finished work of the cross, these are the finished works. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely, what has he done? He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. Hmm? He was, all these things happened in Golgotha. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. It says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And then it says with his stripes. And with his stripes we are. Not we will. It says we are healed. 
Accepting this as a present reality is what will cause the power of healing to surge through your body and your mind. This explains, in fact, Isaiah 53, verse 3, 4, and 5, explains what happened on the cross. Look at verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. I mean, Isaiah 53. He hath, not, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. Remember, they said, release Barnabas and crucify Jesus. He says he was rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. All this happened on the cross. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You remember we hid our faces from him. Peter was asked, do you know him? Are you not one of his disciples? He said, I don't know him. He hid his face. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. Jesus became sickness that we might become health. He became seen on the cross that we might become righteousness. He became poverty that we might become prosperity. One of the mysteries of the cross is the substitutionary work that Christ took on the cross. The substitutionary work. He became sin that we may become righteousness. He became sickness that we may become health. He became poverty that we may become prosperity. Let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Are we getting blessed today? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's look at it to bless you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Powerful. Powerful. Look at it, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Ye you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. This is what we call the substitutionary work. What we were, he became, so that we can be what he was or what he is. Are you catching that? What we were, he became, so that we can be what he was. Or what he is, it is called substitutionary work. What we were, he became, so that we can be what he was or what he is now. He became sin, that we may become righteousness. He became sickness, that we may become health or the healed of the Lord. He became poor, that we may become rich. Look at this verse again, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. It says, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. All the sicknesses, all the sin, and all the poverty was placed on Jesus. And that's why you and I have the opportunity in this new covenant of grace to live a life free of sin or the guilt of sin, free of sickness or the burden of sickness, and free of poverty or the sting of poverty. Now, you say, if all these things happen on the cross, man of God, how come I'm a victim? Oh, do you know why you're a victim? You have not accepted it as a present reality. 
Oh, man of God, I've accepted, but let's just be real. Let's just be real. I feel, I feel uh, my body is sick. I don't, I don't actually, I'm feeling now. The way I'm feeling. Do you know why it's not happening? Because you are accepting the testimony of your senses. That's why Isaiah 53, he began by asking you, whose report are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the report of your body? Or are you going to believe the report of the Lord? Which is, he took sickness that you may be healthy. He took sin that you may be righteous. He took poverty that you may be rich. Now, you have to start practicing believing. How do you do it? By meditating, by confessing, and by accepting. In spite, please listen to this, in spite of your present predicament, in spite of your present circumstances, in spite of what is happening around you or in your body. In 2 Corinthians, my God, I love this. It's one of the verses that really helped in chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are we getting blessed? Come on, are we catching something here? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Oh, I can't wait to read this verse. Please get there, get there. Rosalind, get there. Joan, get there. Eric, ambassador, get there. Ruth, boss, get there. Where is Pauline Treasure? You're quiet. Get there. Get there. Eric, get there. Susan, get there. Get there. Get to 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Never accept the testimony of your environment as a reality. No matter how things are in the physical, it's not the real story. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, oh, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, it says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, ah, but the Things which are not seen, look at it, are eternal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Hey, it says anything that you see in the physical realm is subject to change. Oh boy. Anything you see, you touch, you feel, as long as it is in the realm of the physical, it is temporal. Temporal means it is subject to change. Look at it again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Brothers and sisters, that sickness is not unto death. It is temporal. The symptoms you're feeling in your body is not the real sickness. The real sickness was taken by Jesus on the cross. Don't accept it as a reality. Start resisting it. The Bible says resist the devil and they will flee. Resist those symptoms and they will go. Oh, resist them. How do you do it? By accepting as a reality and a present day reality. The finished works of the cross. How do you accept? With your confession, with your mind, with your attitude, holding on to the word of truth and said, no, Jesus took this sickness, I don't have it. Jesus took this cancer, I don't have it. Jesus took this cold, I don't have it. Jesus took COVID-19, I don't have it. Well, at that time, your body is testifying of all manner of pain 
discomfort and inconvenience, but you refuse to accept the testimony of your body as a reality. Instead, you accept the testimony of Jesus on the cross as a reality. And the moment you accept it, that is what we call resisting the devil. Every symptom will go. The pain will go. The symptoms will disappear. Satan will carry his loads. And who you have always been will become a reality to your body. Remember, you're a spirit. In the mind of God, you're the healed. You're the blessed. You're the forgiven. They're getting blessed. Let me check what you're saying here. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. You know, once these truths become part of your thinking, it becomes easier. And, and, and let me be honest with you. The more you listen to these truths and the more you resist, the easier it becomes. Anything you do twice becomes easy. Anything you do repeatedly becomes a part of you. See, every day I'm telling you sickness is not your portion. And then you do your part. Practice believing by resisting the sickness. Resisting the symptoms. Yes, they are there. But he took my sickness. He took my infirmities. I don't have it. It may not happen instantly. But as your mind gains ascendance over the symptoms of your body, God's power will now flow through your spirit and restore your body back to its original state, the way God created it. <sighs> oh, glory to God. Ruth Boaz is saying very powerful. Carol James, at what point do we stop taking medication as we pray, Pastor? Wonderful, wonderful. I want to answer that now. Carol James is asking, at what point do you stop taking medication? You know, faith is real, Carol. Faith is not, faith is not fake. Faith is not an idea. As you practice believing, your convictions and your assurances will inform your mind to know that it's time to stop this. Nobody will tell you. Your convictions will become so strong until you will feel uneasy in taking the same medicines you've been taking. You know, there's something I want to, to bring to your attention here. Faith does not say that don't go to hospital. Faith does not say don't take medication. You know, the Bible says rightly preaching the word, dividing the word. But as your faith grows, you know, the depth of your faith is determined by the reality of your convictions. Hope, Carol, you're there. The depth of your faith is determined by the realities of your convictions. The more you practice believing, the more you hear the word, the more you think it, the more you say it, you begin to build your convictions. And then your convictions now determines your actions. All of a sudden, you used to take four tablets per day. Your convictions become a bit uneasy with taking four. And you find if you take two, in the convictions of your heart as your faith develops, you realize that what four did to your body, two can able to do it. The other two have been supplanted by your faith. And then as you continue growing your faith, your convictions will begin to inform your mind and bring a certain discomfort in either taking the medication or whatnot. And sometimes as your faith grows, you may have to go to hospital. You may have to be on medication because faith is in degrees. I'm just teaching you how to grow from that little faith to great faith, from being healed through medicine to living in divine health or being healed divinely. Because at the end of the day, all you're looking for is for you to be well. 
So don't feel guilty by going to hospital. No, you can go. Don't feel guilty taking medication. You can take medication. But as your faith grows, you realize your convictions will not allow you to do certain things. So faith is not imposed. I'm not imposing you. Don't take medicine. Don't. No, 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 no. Faith is real. Ah, it, it's not an idea. Faith is, faith is Christ. The Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of your faith. Faith is a reality. Faith is not an idea. As your convictions grow, your faith will begin to inform you on what to do and what not to do. And that brings a balance. And then you begin to live in the realm of divine health. I hope, Carol, I've helped you. And also I've helped many there. See, so what I'm doing now is developing your faith in divine health. Carol, are we good now? Have you understood the whole thing? And it doesn't take time to build your convictions. No, it takes responsibility of faith. Because faith is work. Faith is not just, I have faith. Faith is work. To practice believing is something you should do consciously. As you say, as you think, and as you listen to the word of God, your convictions are being built. I'll be honest with us here. There are many sons and daughters of mine now that are no longer on medication. They came with medication, but their convictions have grown until now their faith is able to cause them live in the realm of divine health. Easy, easy, easy. And that's why, remember point number two. Remember point number two. Expose yourself to the hearing to the reading and the practice of the word. That's how you grow the convictions of your faith, okay? That is how you grow the convictions of your faith. You don't, you know, faith is not just saying I'm healed, I'm healed. No, all these things I'm telling you, these are, I'm building your conviction. I've been building your conviction for the last two weeks. Hey, please. Hey, hey, listen here. Listen here. <laughs> I, I strongly discourage you, especially you listening to me. I strongly discourage you from a lot of encouragement preaching and preaching to get you by. The way they say a word for the day. Uh, the way they say that, uh, there's something they say. No. They say, um, a word for the day. This, this is a word they use. Oh, my goodness, please remind me what they say. Oh, they, they say, oh, my goodness. Um, there's that word they use. Anyway, it's, 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 it, 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 it tends to, to bring the message like uh, um, tomorrow will take care of itself. What do they say? It's just a word they use. There's nothing like a word for the day. You need a word for your life, not the word for the day. I discourage you, feed on the word. Don't just have an encouragement for the day. Just something to push you. Just a word to push. Every day is a new word. That you will never grow. You and your convictions will never develop. <laughs> yes, thank you, mom. Live a day at a time. That is the word I was looking for. Live a day at a time. You know, though they say, I'm just taking a day at a time. I'm just taking the way it is a day at a time. It's, it's so carnal. It's so untie the laws of faith. Live a day at a time. Really? Really? That is not the recipe for victory. You cannot say live a day at a time. Because you must have sequence to build conviction. You must be a master of sequence. You must have, you must drill some things over and over until your conviction has grown enough for you to act. Because faith is an act, but you don't act without conviction. It is the strength of your convictions that inform the actions of your faith. Oh. 
You can feed on a word for the day, live a day at a time. Today, the pastor is preaching about how to live above the storms of life. I came to tell you that no matter what storm you are going through, you're going to come out on the other side. Slap your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I'm coming out on the other side. Tomorrow, oh, your marriage will work. The next tomorrow, you, my goodness. It feels good for the hour. But with time, you realize that you've spent six months without developing any convictions in your heart. You become an encouraged, weak believer who cannot act on the word of God because your convictions are not fully developed. See, faith is an act. That's what the Bible says. Faith without actions is dead. But the actions of faith don't come from your mere decisions. No. The actions of your faith are informed by the depths of your convictions. As you hear the word of God on the same subject, as you speak the word of God over to your life on the same subject, what are you doing? You're building your convictions. And all of a sudden, your convictions will be so strong that you cannot but act out what you believe. And that's what we call the corresponding actions of your faith. That is what brings healing, deliverance, whatever, into your life. The corresponding actions. Are, are, are we catching it? Wow, Ambassador, you must have sequence to build conviction. Faith is an act, but you don't act without conviction. All right. Deacon uh, Esalen, yes, 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 Dad, I like that. Feed on the word. Jacinta Rema. All right. All right. Okay. Are, are you catching the flow? There is the corresponding actions of your faith. You don't just say, I'm acting, I'm acting by faith. You will not act it. That is mere mental assent. The actions of faith comes from the depth of your convictions. Once now you are convicted, you act. It is a natural response. The Bible says, look at it. First John chapter 5, verse 3. First John chapter 5, verse 3. It says, Oh, this is lovely. Please let's get there. First John chapter 5, verse number 3. First John 5, verse 3. It says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, or rather, we do his commandments. And he says, and his commandments are not burdensome. The word you're not able to act out in your life is because your convictions about that word are not strong enough. That's why you can know you should not fornicate, but you still fornicate. You can know that you're the heel of the Lord, but you still go on with sickness. Why? Your convictions are not strong enough for your faith to act. Remember, the word becomes flesh when we act it out. But this action must have a base of conviction. And that's why at your level now, because I know the people kind of people God has called me. God has called me to minister to mature people in the faith. So at your level, if you're listening to me, I know, I know the kind of crowd God has called me to minister to. If you're, at your level now, you can't afford to have encouragement preaching. You need to build sequence. And they should thank God for me. That any time I handle a topic, I will stay with it for a week, for two, for even three weeks. What am I doing? It's not because I have nothing else to preach. No. I wish you knew. I've never even finished any sermon. But what am I doing? But the wisdom of the Spirit, by repetition and staying on one subject, I'm building your conviction. And as I build your convictions, then you're able to act out your faith. And that's what is called the corresponding actions of your faith. And as you act out what you deeply believe, you see the power of God. Whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's provision, whatever. That now becomes the miracle life. Oh, glory to God. All right, Sylvia says, the word becomes flesh when you act it out. I thank God for you, sir. Welcome, sweetheart. Rosalind, the, all right, good. Jacinta convictions, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. I tell you, I tell you, Pauline, yes, dad, and all that. You see, you know, 
this is this is this is this is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think my time is up. But at least now we've done four. We look at the seven steps to divine healing. Number one, know your rights in Christ. Know what belongs to you. In other words, know who you are. You're not begging God for healing. No, you are healed. You are healed in Christ Jesus. Number two, we say it, expose yourself to the hearing and the reading and the acting of God's word. Number three, seek spiritual understanding. Don't just hear the word, don't just write notes, but by the help of the Holy Spirit. And how do you do that? We say by meditation and by repetition. And then number four now is accept as reality the finished works of Christ on the cross. Part of it is healing. He secured healing for us. Tomorrow, look at step number five, step number six. And then by Sunday will be step number seven. And Sunday we have is our covenant day of healing and deliverance part two. Today in the boardroom, as I was meditating, I began to feel an anointing. <laughs> I began to feel the power of God. I perceive on Sunday there's going to be a strong move of God here in the sanctuary. Come and come with a friend. And come mostly with an expectant heart. Something may break loose. The manifest power of God. I was just meditating today and I felt something for Sunday. Sunday is your healing day. This Sunday is your deliverance day. And please, again, I insist, don't come alone. Come with a friend. We are already constructing our overflow tent. It's already by Sunday. We should be able to use part of it. So don't mind about this space. If it's space and social distancing, I think by Sunday we'll be somewhere. But I'd like you to invite a friend on Sunday. First service at 9, second service at 11. Purposefully invite a friend and purposefully prepare yourself for a divine visitation. This Sunday, remember we are on Garden Estate Road. Uh, in Garden Estate, if you're coming from the city center in Nairobi, Kenya, you take the Tika Road Superhighway, you take Exit 7, you'll pass the famous Roasters Restaurant, then you pass uh, Methodist Church, then you'll see us, our signage and our structures, we're so big you can't miss us. But our purpose to meet with God, there's a visitation coming to this house on Sunday, even those who are far and you'll be watching online, Prepare to meet the Lord. It's a visitation on this Sunday. It's going to be something. It's going to be something. And you're going to be healed. No sickness will remain in your body. I tell you, the Bible says he healed all that were sick. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. He healed all. So all will be healed this Sunday. And please, if there is a relative or a friend that you know they are, they are struggling with one disease or another, carry them to the sanctuary. Some of them will be healed as I'm preaching. Others may require the gift of healing. And we will do it. I'm so excited about this Sunday. Don't miss it for anything. Oh, I, even speaking about it, I'm feeling the anointing. You know, the beauty about a spiritual man, he doesn't have surprises. These are realities that are communicated in the realms, even before they happen in the natural. Remember we said realities are programmed. How? By your spirit. You can sense something that God is about to do. And I can tell you, I can tell you for a fact this Sunday is your visitation. And even if your need is not healing, somebody will encounter the Lord in a very unique way this Sunday. Don't miss it for anything. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be, there's a visitation. I insist, carry a friend. I know why. 
any time you come for a divine visitation and you and you come with an expectant heart something is added to you come with either your colleague your brothers your sisters your entire family your neighbors please purpose is Sunday not to come alone and those who are watching from far purpose to invite your friends and this is not really for crowd no this is for encounters something will land over your life he says go to the highways and to the hedges and do what compel them to come that my house may be full yes yes we want to fill the house of god but more importantly i want everyone to have an encounter with the lord don't forget tomorrow tomorrow we are continuing with the same at 6 p.m. and tomorrow is live on ground service. Will be step number five on healing. Then on Sunday, we'll do that. Are we blessed? And don't forget Sunday, the third service. My daughter, Sarah Nations, the dentist. You'll be hearing a testimony live, how she was healed of an eye condition that was there for I think 17, 18 years. You see photos of how she was and the glasses and how she is now, healed, does a dentistry work without any issue for some time now. She's is a heal of the Lord. I'll read a testimony of one of us who is now four weeks pregnant. She's been going through miscarriages and we believe in God from the fruit of the womb. And just by connecting to this grace, she is now four weeks pregnant. I have the testimony with me. You see, I love something about the God of Miracle Life. We not only teach, we manifest. The Bible says the things Jesus began both to do and to teach. So we are doing these things as we explain them in the teaching. It's not just words. The Bible says for the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 4.20, is not in words only, but in power. In power. In power. In power. Sunday, you will encounter this power in the name of Jesus. Well, in one minute, I want to know how this program has blessed you. Just tell me something. What has this program done to you? Just say it now. Tina saying, very prepared in the name of Jesus. Wonderful. Pauline Treasure, amen. Pauline says, very blessed. Sylvia, oh yes, dad, very blessed. Truly blessed. Very blessed. Just in one minute, tell me what you've learned in this service or what you've liked in this service or how. I mean, just, just in one minute, do it very quickly before we do our offering. And uh, I speak the last blessing. Actually, what time is up? Okay, come out says, truly blessed. Just 10 more comments and I'll be good to pray for us. How, how, how has this teaching today, has it touched you? What have you learned? If you can even in one statement just write what you caught. Evangelist William Rain says, Amen. Ambassador, I will encounter his power. Simeon Fortune, Amen. Sylvia, Amen, that to be aware that I'm a look-alike of Christ. Oh, yes. There is no difference between you and Christ because you have put on Christ. Catch that. Ruth Boa says, this service is life transforming. All right, Amos Muti, so blessed. Okay, all right, still waiting for a few comments. Still waiting for a few comments. How, how, or what have I said that you're saying, my God, I'm holding on that. You know, you must learn to reduce everything in words. I learned that secret in the spirit. No one has ever taught me that. It's the Holy Ghost who taught me. Anything you want, reduce to words. You want a house, describe the house in words. Words help you to paint a picture in your mind. You want a job, describe it in words. You want a gift, describe it in words. Then start eating those words. As you eat those words, you become those words. And the power of God is released, all right? Simon Fortin says the service is life changing. Let me get three or four more. Ambassador must accept the finished works of Christ for them to become a reality in my life. Prince Jeremy from Mombasa. This service is really a blessing full of breakthrough. 
All right, Dickness Helen says, so blessed, more enlightened. Sylvia prays, knowing that Jesus became sickness for my health, poverty uh, for me to be rich and all that. Wonderful, wonderful, Sylvia. You got it, you got it. This is so, so nice. Father, I thank you for your children. I pray that your power, your ability, your healing ability will manifest in their bodies and in their minds. I declare you healed wherever you are. Healed from back pains. Healed from headaches. Healed from tumors and growths. Healed from any kind of bleeding that is not of God in your body. Healed from breathing problems. Somebody is being healed. Somebody who had a breathing problem. It's like your chest was congested. It has just opened up now. 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 It has opened now. I tell you the truth. I'm touching in the spirit. You're healed. The healing power of God is flowing here. Be healed wherever you are. In Jesus' blessed name. Amen and amen. Please now, it's time for us to do our tithes, uh, our offerings. It's time for us to give to the Lord. Oh, glory. Glory to God. You're paying your tithe. You are offering your fast foods. Or you're redeeming a sacrifice. Uh, uh, the information is on the screen. I want to believe. All right. Information is on the screen. Let us give. And then let everyone gather your offering, your seed to communicate your prayers and your faith for divine help. Never forget, your seed is the communication of your faith in monetary terms. It is the response of your human spirit to the presence and the word at hand. We're talking about divine health. You don't play with your offering. You, you don't just give anything. That you're giving is, it shows how you have accepted the message. It shows how you have connected to the message. It shows how you have accepted the impact of the message. This is health. Let your faith be expressed through your giving. Let me start with Titus and fast footers and any covenant redeemer. Father, thank you for the Titus. I pray, Lord, that in the name of Jesus, every tither, every fast footer is blessed in Jesus' name. Now let everyone gather your faith in your seed, the response of the human spirit, the seriousness of this topic, put it in that offering. Communicate it. The Bible says where your heart is, your treasure will be. You will never rise above your giving. Your giving is your faith in monetary terms. It's the communication of your deepest beliefs to God. It's a very important thing. Father, thank you now for every offering, every response of the human spirit, every seed sown. Let it communicate health to their bodies and to their minds. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Let's do this. All right, God bless you. Well, it's time for me to say bye-bye. But always remember, always remember, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Health is your portion in Christ Jesus. Don't accept anything less than that. Let's meet tomorrow. Lunch time, 1 p.m. As we look at how to design your miracle mate. Then in the evening, the 1 p.m. is an online service. In the evening, we are continuing with the seven steps to divine health and healing from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Please be here in church and those who are far be online. This is so, so awesome. I have a testimony that has just come in. As one of my daughters, she says, uh, I need to read this for you people. It's so, so awesome. Uh, where has it gone? All right, dad, since you started doing this topic, I no longer have the symptoms I had because the teaching exposes the reality and my body is catching the reality. This, my daughter, had some serious symptoms in her body and she even went to hospital. She says since the topic started,
the symptoms are no longer there. Sweetheart, I'd like you to know that you are the healed of the Lord. The sickness will not come back because the word is a permanent healer. Keep exposing yourself to the teaching of God's word. Well, please, I have to say bye-bye. Lifted for life. God bless you. Bye-bye.